Nancy, you saw me before to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you, God. Uh, would each of you state your names for the record, please? Starting with Dr. Jones. Dr. Ronald Coy Jones. Malcolm O'Carey. Robert M. McClellan. Paul St. Peter's. We've also uh, been advised that Dr. Baxter should be coming today, and we have a name tag here for him, and we hope that he um, appears before too long. We'll uh, swear him at that time. I'd like to thank all of you gentlemen for coming today. I, I know that each of you has testified to the Warren Commission. I have a copy here of the testimony that you gave uh, to the Warren Commission. We, the, the Assassination Records Review Board, as part of its work mandated by Congress, I was able to digitize the original autopsy material uh, by a very high quality digitization process. And we hoped that we had been able to we would have been able to bring some of those photographs uh, with us today to to show you and to get your observations on those. Unfortunately, at the last minute we were not able to make the necessary security arrangements. Uh, the review board has done uh, a fair amount of work in trying to collect as much as it could in, in terms of the medical evidence, with the focus having been particularly on the autopsy at Bethesda. I wanted to uh, talk with you today. This will not be in a typical deposition style format. I'd like to have it somewhat more of a discussion among you. Uh, because there are four of you and we hope soon to be five of you, it's important that you not talk at the same time so that the reporter is able to get the words down. I'm sure she's very good, but she cannot do two people at the same time. So please try to be alert for that. I wanted to tell you a little bit in brief about some of the work that we have done to give you a, a sense of, of why we thought it might be useful to conduct this uh, discussion today. Uh, I have myself deposed all of the uh, autopsy doctors, the doctors Hume, Fink, and Boswell, and so we have their testimony under oath. And I took their testimony for the first time in the presence of the original autopsy materials at, uh, at Bethesda, now at the National Archives. I also took the depositions of Dr. Str or Mr. Stringer, who was the autopsy photographer, as well as his assistant, Floyd Reby. Um, I'd like to just advise you that each of those people confirmed that the photographs uh, were authentic photographs. They were the photographs that were uh, taken, with one exception that, that is worth noting, and that, that is that there was a uh, question in the mind of Dr. Or Mr. Stringer about whether the supplemental brain photographs were, in fact, the photographs that he took. The photographs, as they appear, do not conform with his recollection of how he did it, or the kind of film that he used or the prints that were used to develop them subsequently. So there was a question uh, raised about that. I uh, took the deposition of Dr. Boswell, as I mentioned, and he made some drawings on a uh, basically life-sized human skull, which I have brought here today and would like to make reference to, and so I will be showing you that in a moment. One other thing that I would like to just advise you on uh, briefly, is we identified the person who had developed autopsy photographs from President Kennedy. Uh, she was a witness who had not previously been identified before. Her name is Sandra Spencer, and she worked at the Naval Photographic Center, National Photographic Center, in Washington. She, in the course of her work, typically did White House photography. She also said that shortly after the assassination, she developed photographs the photographs that she says that she developed did not correspond with those that were in the National Archives. So according to her testimony, there was some photograph that she herself developed that showed a wound in the occipital parietal area. The occipital parietal uh, wound, to, for those of you who have, have seen the photos, does not appear to be of any significant size. There is the possibility of an entrance wound there but the wounds that she identified uh, from the photographs that she developed uh, were different from the ones that appear in the National Archives. Now, as is always the case, uh, memories fade, memories are distorted, and one needs to take all recollections with a grain of salt, particularly after 35 years. So we're very aware of that, and we understand that. But I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the issues partly in light of uh, the information that we've uh, had before. But again, let me thank you for 
uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. We appreciate doing this, and I think that we should be able to complete this within um, a couple of hours. Uh, what I'd like to do is hand each of you a, a packet of materials which you are free to keep after the deposition. You are free to, you should feel free to look at them, to not look at them, whichever uh, you would most uh, prefer to do. But what I would like to do is make reference to uh, some of the statements that previously were made. Oh, no, the, there's a, no, each of, each of you has a stack with everyone's okay. statements in it. They should all be um, correct. What I have done is gone through these um, uh, depositions. Excuse me, yeah, maybe I can ask my secretary to see if she can find where Dr. Baxter is. Sure, sure. I don't know. Maybe the recording It was, let me wait for a minute. No, I'd love to test. <laughs> you do that phonetically. Mm-hmm. I still don't see how it can be done. I've been doing it for 10 years. I've been watching it done. We get to a lot of our meetings and discussions and our scientific meetings. Of course, they're recorded, too. They're often taken down like that. I've always been able to Are they? Yeah. With machine shorting? Yeah, people take them down personally, but they're also recorded. Okay. Anyway, you get up and discuss a paper at a scientific meeting. Before Mr. Hawkins of the White House press died, he sent me a transcript of that press conference. I've handed each of you a packet that has the testimony of uh, witnesses before the Warren Commission. These are all uh, Dallas doctors. In addition to those of you who are here today, uh, there's also the testimony of Drs. Clark and Jenkins. I have a copy of the testimony of Dr. Carrico with me, but I don't have not distributed a set of that. This just didn't uh, make it through. What I'd like to do is talk with you for a few minutes about the description of the wound as you saw it, of the head wound as you saw it in uh, Dallas. Uh, obviously, as you know, there has been some discussion about the, the location of the wound on the head. It is m my own understanding in reading the testimony that you have offered that the question about the significance of the wound to the head was not focused on by the Warren Commission. Uh, Arlen Specter, who took your deposition, did not particularly focus on it. Each of you made references to the wound on the head, and I found that in the testimony. I'd like to draw your attention to that, and if we can go through those uh, quickly, and then I'd like to get um, your um, observations. We'll start with where you were in the hospital uh, or in the in trauma room number one, and then and then talk about uh, these. But if we can start with Dr. Uh, Baxter, this is for the record uh, MD 97. On the first page of uh, the, the packet that I've given to you, a handwritten note, she refers to um, what appears to me to be um, temporal and occipital bones is about six or seven ways down. It says te uh, temporal and occipital bones were missing and the brain was lying on the table. Further in, in his testimony to the Warren Commission, this is on page 41, he says, and I quote, literally the right side of his head had been blown off. With this and the observation that the cerebellum was present, a large quantity of brain was present on the car. Well, we felt that such an additional heroic attempt was not warranted. He then, uh, farther down on page 41, refers to the temporal parietal plate of bone laid outward to the side. Mr. Spector, in the, in the page following, refers to what he, what uh, Dr. Baxter had referred to as uh, temporal and occipital at the top of the head. Uh, later on page 44, there's a reference to the temporal and parietal bones were missing and the brain was lying on the table with extensive lacerations and contusions. In the second uh, uh, packet of materials that comes from 
which is labeled MD39, which again is the one you don't have from Dr. Carrico. He refers in his handwriting to oozing from cerebral and cerebellar tissue. He then on page three of his Warren Commission testimony states the skull was fragmented and bleeding cerebral and cerebellar tissue. On page six, he refers to about a five to seven centimeter in size, more or less circular injury of the right occipital parietal area. Doctors Carrico and Perry went to uh, Washington, D.C. and testified to the Warren Commission. And he, in, from his testimony to the commission itself, he says on page 361 uh, that there was, and I'm going to read this the way that it appears in the transcript, and there obviously is an error in the transcript, but he says this was a 5 by 71 centimeter defect in the posterior skull, the occipital region. There was an absence of calvarium or skull in this area. Dr. Carrico was subsequently interviewed by the House Select Committee. Charlie, this is Mr. Jerry McGann. We did our best. I'm happy to report that Dr. Baxter is with us, and if Dr. Baxter, if you wouldn't mind uh, swearing. Dr. Baxter, do you saw me swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Dr. Baxter, I've given the other doctors a little bit of background, and during a break I can talk to you about what we have said before. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. This will not be a typical deposition format, but I'd like to have a discussion. At this point, I just wanted to uh, uh, briefly refer to previous statements that had been made uh, by you and the other doctors uh, regarding the wound to President Kennedy's head. Uh, going back to, to Dr. Carrico, and again, this one is not present for you, he said to the House Select Committee on Assassinations that there was a large wound in the right side of the head in the parietal occipital area. One could see blood and brains, both cerebral and cere cerebrum fragments in that uh, wound. L let me let me read this again. He said both cerebellum and cerebrum fragments in that wound. I stated that correctly. Uh, later, he said, this is still to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the head wound was much larger wound than the neck wound. It was five by seven centimeters, something like that two and a half by three inches, ragged, had blood and hair all around it, located in the part of the parietal occipital region, and there was brain tissue uh, showing through. The next uh, testimony comes from Dr. Clark. Uh, this is MD 37. And uh, in a summary statement that was typed up, this is on Commission Exhibit 392, again, part of the package that I had given to you. He refers to um, there was a wound, one in the lower third of the anterior neck, the other in the occipital region of the skull. And then on the second page, uh, Dr. Clark referred to there was a large wound in the right occipital parietal region. Then in his testimony to the Warren Commission, he refers on page 20 to a large gaping wound in the right posterior part with cerebral excuse me, cerebral and cerebellar tissue being damaged and exposed. On page 29, he says that there was a much larger wound in the right occipital region of the president's skull from which considerable blood, considerable blood loss had occurred, which stained the back of his head, neck, and upper shoulders. Then to Dr. Jenkins, he refers, this is from Packet, uh, MD 96. He refers to a great laceration on the right side of the head, temporal and occipital. He also says there were cerebellum had protruded from the wound. In his testimony to the Warren Commission, he said that on page 48, he thought that this wound in the head was 
a wound of exit, although he wasn't sure. He said, quote, I really think part of the cerebellum, as I recognize it, was herniated from the wound. He then said that I thought there was a wound on the left temporal area, right in the hairline and right above the zygomatic process. From page 51 of his Warren Commission testimony, he says, because the wound with the exploded area of the scalp, as I interpreted it being exploded, I would interpret it being a wound of exit and the appearance of the wound in the neck, and I also thought it was a wound of exit. Finally, in his uh, testimony to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, he said, there was one segment of bone blown out. It was a segment of occipital or temporal bone. He noted that a portion of the cerebellum, lower rear brain, was hanging out from a hole in the right rear of the head. Then Dr. Jones, in uh, his testimony to the Warren Commission, this is uh, packet MD-98, on page 53 he says there was a small wound at the midline of the neck and a large wound in the right posterior side of the head. A large defect, later there was a large defect in the back side of the head. And then, in, again, in testimony to the Warren Commission on page 56, he said that it, there appeared uh, to be an exit wound in the posterior portion of the skull. And again, Mr. Spector referred to that as the top of the president's head. And finally, in handwritten comment, this is on the last page of the packet that I've given to you, uh, it says there was a small Oh, that just refers to the, to the neck. I won't read that. Then Dr. McClelland, in his testimony to the Warren Commission, said, I noted that the right posterior portion of the skull had been extremely blasted. It had been shattered, apparently by the force of the shot, so that the parietal bone was protruded up through the scalp and seemed to be fractured almost along its right posterior half, as well as some of the occipital bone being fractured in its lateral half and this sprung open the bones that I had mentioned in such a way that you could actually look down into the skull cavity itself and see that probably a third or so, at least, of the brain tissue, posterior cerebral tissue, and some of the cerebellar tissue had been blasted out. That was from page 33, if I didn't mention that. Then on page 34, he also mentions loss of cerebral and cerebellar tissue. Uh, from Dr. Perry, in handwritten notes, on page excuse me, for packet MD-57, uh, he refers to a right posterior cranium, excuse me, a large wound of the right posterior cranium was noted exposing severely lacerated brain. On page nine of his testimony to, doc, to Mr. Spector, he refers to the uh, large wound of the right posterior parietal area. And on page 11 of the same testimony, he refers to a large avulsive injury of the right occipital parietal area. And then on page 372, and this would be testimony to the Warren Commission itself, unless I'm mistaken, the Warren Commission itself. I noted a large avulsive wound of the right parietal occipital area in which both scalp and portions of the skull were absent, and there was severe laceration of underlying brain tissue. Um, and finally, with Dr. Uh, Peters, last but not least, of course, uh, this is from MD40, testimony to Mr. Spector of the Warren Commission on page 71. He says that he noticed there was a large defect in the occiput. Dr. Peters then says, it seemed to me that the right occipital parietal area that there was, a, there was a large defect. There appeared to be bone loss and brain loss in the area. He goes on to say, we saw the wound of, uh, I'm sorry, that refers just to the uh, throat wound. It, in my very lay sense, um, and I am not a doctor, there seems to be a fair degree of coherence among the testimony that, that you offered about uh, the location of the wound. There, of course, is a difference in the way that you said it as would be expected in any case. Uh, I'd like to start out, and that, that's the last major part that I will hope to play in this 
uh, discussion. I'd like to start out, if we could, and maybe just start with Dr. Jones and, and then just go down the room. Of first, where you were in trauma room number one and what kind of view you had of President Kennedy in trauma room number one, Dr. Jones? I was on the left side uh, below the left arm looking uh, to my right could easily see the neck wound, could not see in much detail the posterior wound, but did not see any flap of skull or, or anything laying out to the right side. A relaxation of the facial tissue, perhaps of the, of the hair. And I, I remained on the president's right side during the entire resuscitation. Did you ever go around and observe the left side? The left side, excuse me, on the left side. Okay. Right side. So all, all of your view was of the left side? All my view was from the president's left side. Okay. Did you ever go around and observe the right side of the president? I did president? not go around the right side. Could, could you observe any posterior wound on of the head from the left side where you were? At one point, after we had completed the uh, insertion of the chest tube, IV, and the tracheotomy, I looked up over the top of the president's head, and from that view was all that I saw, but with him flat on the table, could not appreciate the size of that wound, but did not see a lot of skull or brain tissue uh, on the table. Some maybe, but not just a tremendous amount. I certainly did not see a flap turned on the right side. Were, were you yourself able to identify any cerebellum or cerebrum tissue on the table? <clears throat> if there was, I thought from, from my vantage I thought uh, that uh, it was very small amount. And were you able to identify one form of brain tissue versus another? No. Okay. So I did see a very small wound, which I thought was an interesting wound. That was pretty clear. Okay. Dr. Perry? As I testified, I made only a cursory examination of his. Where were you uh, standing, and, and if you moved around? And I was just about to jump right because I was on the left side. Could, could you describe about how big the tracheostomy wound was that you cut? I've been asked this a lot, of course. Uh, someone said it was too big for a surgeon to die. And my reply to that is it was big enough. The only two medical emergencies, airway and bleeding, everything else was waiting. It just didn't wait. I had no idea. I made it big enough. At that time, we used old metal clamps, tracheostomy too. Quite large for the cut on. I made an incision to the wound. I made it big enough for I could do a tracheotomy of that bone. I also made it big enough that I could look through the side of the trachea. Uh, there was blood in the trachea through the end. And one looked through the syringe itself and the head and put it in the trachea too. There was blood inside the trachea. The hair and the knee was shiny. And I didn't know what I was going to encounter a wound of carotid arteries or whatever. I was busy putting in the, the left chest tube and doing a cut down on the left arm. 
lot of things to do that. We all started with about an average size incision. I didn't see anything abnormally large or, or an abnormal length of the incision. It's bigger than I would make for an elected situation. The patient is not an extremist where you're doing an electric radiography and you make a nice tiny stem line incision and I can minimize the stuff from scarring. In an emergency situation, you make an incision adequate to accomplish the job. In this case, it's going to take more. Uh, after I've made the incision, uh, about the swelling arrived and the hands came in to see if stuff needs to trick the oxygen. I had made the incision at that time, but Bob may recall that big part, but he built the factor for it. It's big enough for me to control the trachea, and it's necessary to do a little more. Pardon me? Can you speak up just a little bit more? Can you speak up just a little bit louder? Did you get that? Yes. Yeah. Dr. McClellan, where were you standing, first of all? Uh, I was standing at the head of the gap, and uh, Dr. Perry, as he said, uh, when I arrived, and I walked by the left side of the cart and uh, walked around to the head, and was standing at the right of Dr. Jenkins, and uh, I got an Army Navy, which is a particular name that would apply to a, a common nuclear tractor and leaned over the president's head to help retract while our scientific security was finishing up the trade route. So I was standing where I was looking down intently into the room and really had nothing to do but that because I didn't take much uh, attention to pulling the tractor. And so I could Excuse me. When you refer, when you're referring to the wound, are you referring to what I'll call the head wound, back, not the throat? Okay. And I think, as I said in my testimony, that this wound looked pretty much like everybody else has described it. It was a very large wound, and I would agree that it was at least seven or eight centimeters in diameter, and it was mostly really in the occipital part of the skull. And uh, as I was looking at it, uh, a fairly large portion of the cerebellum fell out of the skull. There was already some brain there, but uh, during the tracheostomy, more fell out. And that was clearly the cerebellum. And, it was, uh, it was out. And, uh, and I was that far away. When you say that far, you're putting your hands about 12 inches apart? 12 to 18 inches. And about how long were you at the head of the table? Uh, until they finished up the tracheostomy. I don't know exactly how long that would be, but I think it has to be an absolute minimum of five minutes, uh, probably somewhere between five and ten. But it was certainly more than just a Dr. Peters, where were you standing? Well, <clears throat> I got there about, from what I've been able to determine, about 40 seconds later. And Dr. Perry was already there and taking charge and giving the directions. And uh, he was uh, over the president's chest on the president's left side. Dr. Baxter was up in the right side in the axillary area. And so I stepped in about the level of the belly button on the right side. And Max said, uh, help Charlie sort out one of these straight tubes, and which I did then and gave Charlie the one that looked like it was the appropriate size, and he and uh, Malcolm put it in, and we continued the resuscitative efforts. A lot of things were going on simultaneously. Jim had tubed the president, and then when he tried to bag him, there was a big air leak, and so they decided they would put the uh, tracheostomy tube uh, in through the wood in the neck, and that's what caused Malcolm to enlarge that. and. Uh, they, we got the right size tube and it slid it into place and Malcolm continued external compression. Uh, I guess Ron in the meantime had done a cut down and uh, was giving blood to the president. And uh, Max said, uh, I wonder if we should open the chest and squeeze the heart. And somebody else was standing there and said, no, no, don't do that. Said Hopkins two weeks ago reported a study where you just ended up putting your fingers through the ventricle after a short period of time. And it, you could get effective enough resuscitation through the closed chest. 
And then Dr. Jenkins said, boys, before you think about opening the chest, you better step up here and look at this brain. And so at that point, I did step around Dr. Baxter and look in the president's head. And I reported to the Warren Commission that there was about a seven centimeter hole in the occipital parietal area, that there was obviously quite a bit of brain missing. Some brain was hanging down in the wound. And I thought the cerebellum had been injured as well as the cerebral cortex. That's what I said at the time. Now, could I bring up some controversies that uh, Sure. Have happened since that time, or shall we go on maybe? So what, what Dr. Mack yeah, let, let, I Please, I would like to come back to that. So if I forget, please remind me, because I would like to, to deal with as much as we can today. And then I said, well, uh, looks like we have to declare the president dead. And uh, where's Mrs. Kennedy? And she was standing right beside me, as close as Bob is. So I give that as evidence that we were pretty clearly focused, as Malcolm said were pretty busy. We were concentrating on what we were doing. I think the president received excellent resuscitative efforts by current standards, let alone the standards of 1963. And, uh, I think that was the right choice to give it the maximum effort, even though he appeared an extremist. Dr. Baxter, where were you standing first? Well, everything happened awfully fast, if you can. Imagine the, you know, I forget exactly when I got there, what I did, uh, other than go straight to the airway with uh, Dr. Carrico. And uh, we, well, we did a few things, get Miss Kennedy out of the room, uh, asked the nurse to take her out, looked at uh, what the vital signs were, uh, what was going IV, what the catheter was in his urinary bladder, tube down his throat, everything had been done, including uh, Dr. Carrico had already given him uh, corticosteroids uh, because of his history of being a Madisonian. Uh, as had already been mentioned, uh, airway was a problem. Dr. Carrico said, I just can't ventilate him. And Mac and I started working on uh, what, you know, what the problem was at airway. Uh, none of us at that time, I don't think, were in any position to view the hand injury. And in fact, I never saw anything uh, above the, the scalp line, uh, forehead line, uh, that I could comment on. Uh, the only thing that was outstanding about it is that he had huge hemorrhages around his eyes, uh, black eyes, if you will, uh, from the force of the injury. Uh, and he had exophthalmus. His eyes were bulging and blood had uh, gone into the periorbital tissues. And we immediately were working on why we couldn't ventilate him. And Ron was putting in a chest tube on one side. On the other side, we stuck a needle in. Uh, little air was obtained. Uh, we didn't know. The only thing we could figure, without knowing how bad this head injury was, we were doing all the resuscitating things to give him a chance to live, in essence. And uh, so we decided that, that we had to do a trach, and we moved in to do that uh, immediately. A chest tube was being put uh, on, the, on the left side as we were doing the trach. Uh, I think Dr. Peters was doing that uh, while we were working uh, to get the trach in. Uh, the wound that was in his neck, as I recall it, uh, was the size that Dr. Perry described. Uh, I didn't remember when we uh, got the incision made and going down that there was uh, any striking tissue damage. Uh, maybe that's just not a good recall, but I didn't think that the tissues didn't look like to me that or I don't recall them looking like anything had much gone through there. Uh, and we got the trach in as had been described, and uh, about that time his pulse began to rapidly go down and the, the quote, cardiac arrest, the stoppage of the heart occurred very shortly after that. And uh, I think I was probably negligent in not looking at the whole situation, including the head injury, uh, but struck with the uh, what it all meant. I think all of us just kind of backed off. Uh, and I never examined
further than that. Uh, went out and got Miss Kennedy and brought her in and, and uh, had to tell her that, that her husband was dead. And uh, uh, we agreed not to pronounce him until the priest arrived and gave him the last rites as, as his Catholic procedure, I understand. And uh, that's all I really saw and did in the whole thing. I would like all of you to feel free to please make comments about other observations to the extent that you disagree with them. That would be helpful to put in the record. As is always the case on something like this, people are going to re see it differently and remember it differently, and I don't see that as being uh, anything unusual. So please don't hesitate to uh, do it. I know my wife and I frequently have very different perceptions of <laughs> the same thing. Comment on one thing. I, I don't recall that we had any vital Bubbling around the throat suggests uh, life in and of itself, or is that not? Yeah, the, One thing I should state here is a few times uh, Dr. McClellan has been referred to as Mac. Is that correct? Just for the historical record, if somebody later wants to know if there's some two other person. Right. Mac Perry and Bob McClellan. McClellan. Both so are you both Mac? Well, nickname too. Okay. Uh, Dr. McClellan, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm Mac Perry. I'm from Mac Perry. Uh, only thing I want to say is I remember very well when Mac said. And which uh, Mac is this? Mac Perry. Okay. Dr. Perry said, uh, I think there might be some air in the chest. Let's put in chest two. And I remember cutting uh, President Kennedy's chest on the right side and noticing that the blood was, uh, there was a no pulsatile flow from the wound. And I agree with what Dr. Perry said and Dr. Jones said the EKG was a straight line all the time it was on. After Dr. Perry was, or while he was giving external compression, I could feel a pulse uh, consummate with the pressure he applied in the right femoral area, but I saw no evidence of a spontaneous heartbeat. And I've asked many people over the years, uh, did you really see the president take a breath? And uh, Dr. Baxter, Dr. Jenkins, and Dr. Carrico both said they thought they saw an agonal respiration. So did I. I, well, I think we all did. Okay. Yeah, when I came in the room, the very first thing that hit me was had he not had that in the absence of the pulse and the absence of the sexual pressure and everything, had he not had that, I would not have 
Dr. Peters, there was something that you had said that you had wanted to talk about. Well, it was concerning the injury to the cerebellum. Uh, I saw it at uh, that time when I looked in his skull after Dr. Jenkins said, boys, you better come up here and take a look at this brain before you do anything as heroic as opening the chest and massaging the heart directly. And uh, I uh, thought the cerebellum was injured. And of course, it was obvious there was quite a bit of the cerebral cortex missing. And uh, I looked at it uh, for a moment. And uh, so when I was interviewed a few days later by Mr. Spector, I said, I thought the cerebellum was injured. Uh, Dr. John Latimer is a good friend of mine uh, from Columbia University in New York. And he's a historian and has written a text on the Kennedy and Lincoln assassinations, comparing them. J. Edgar Hoover was a good friend of his and let him look at the assassination pictures. That was going to be about 25 years before I was going to get to look at them. And he told me he thought the tentorium was intact over the cerebellum. And that concerned me a little bit. Well, when I went to uh, view the National Archives autopsy pictures, I saw that the cerebellum was indeed injured and shoved way down on that right side compared to its mate on the left on the pictures of the brain that they showed me at the National Archives. And it was compatible with being President Kennedy's brain based on the lacerations in it that I saw in the photo. But the cerebellum was pushed down quite a bit. And I, I felt pretty good about that then, that my original observation was that the cerebellum had been injured. Dr. Latimer didn't think that it had. But it would certainly be feasible to think that it was with the tremendous pressure that must have existed for a moment in that side of the head when that bullet struck his occipital parietal area. And so um, I asked if I could see the brain at the National Archives and not just the photos, and they said the brain has been, been made unavailable by Mr. Robert Kennedy, who was Attorney General at the time. And uh, so I never did really get to see the actual brain itself. All I had was the pictures. But I, it was interesting to me this morning hearing these men recount their remembrances of the actual uh, care at that time, uh, noting that the cerebellum did appear to be injured. So that remains a little controversy in my mind. Uh, if I can ask you one side question uh, regarding Dr. Latimer. Did he say to you that he had seen autopsy photos that J. Edgar Hoover had in his possession? That's what he led me to believe. Off the record, I could say a word about that. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Latimer took care of J. Edgar Hoover, and uh, so he was a historian and quite interested in things, so he went to Mr. Hoover and asked him. He could see the photos, and uh, Mr. Hoover, who didn't like Bobby Kennedy very well at all, said that, Oh, uh, John, there was won't be available for 10 or 15 years on their release. And uh, he said, well, that's what Bobby said you would say. Oh, did Bobby say that? You come over Monday morning, and I'll let you look at him. And so that's what he did. He looked at him. And he's the one who told me he wasn't sure the cerebellum had been injured, as I had testified. Uh, I thought it was. And uh, having viewed the pictures at the National Archives, I still feel that it was. It was certainly displaced, if not lacerated. Well, I know it I don't often say that, but I, I didn't just glance at it. I looked at it for several minutes. And uh, it's clearly clear about it. And I could look down into the skull. In fact, I made that point there. There was nothing in the, in the uh, area where the cerebellum Most of it was probably gone when I first began to look down into the uh, And then as I stood there, probably just maybe a minute after I came down, another uh, large portion of it, which I thought, I remember thinking now that more likely the rest of it was going to lose out on the table. So there's not, well, I kind of think it was. It was. I, I'd like to hand out um, a, a document to each of you that. Uh, first appeared in a book by uh, Josiah Thompson, which I assume that you're all uh, familiar with. 
we mark this as exhibit number 264. I think when Mr. Pogner was looking at it, it was the 707. So I'm not sure I've seen Mr. Thompson. Have you got a copy of it? No. Oh. Professor of philosophy uh, at uh, Temple, Temple or Villanova, I'm oh, forgetting yeah. which. Uh, there, there's a picture on page 107 of exhibit uh, 264. I'd like to ask those of you who, who saw the head wound if this corresponds to what you observed or if any of you has, based upon your own observations, it seems inaccurate in any way. Obviously, it's a drawing, and so there will be a problem problem with it. But just your observations on it, for those of you who observed the head wound, does this look like what you saw in uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital? I told him when he was asking me to describe that picture from which he drew this, that the first thing I saw when I came in the room, in addition to that, pentagonal restoration was the edge of the parietal bone was sticking up through the scalp. And that's not on that picture, but what we were trying to depict here is what the posterior part of the wound looked like. In other words, this is not the entire wound, it's simply the <coughs> posterior part of it and what I thought of as the, the critical part of it at that time and still do. Does any of you have any? I think uh, it uh, pretty much corresponds to what I said, except no bridle. It looks a little further down. It's what the posterior part of the wound looks like. In other words, this is not the entire wound. It's simply the <coughs> posterior part of it and what I thought of as the, the critical part of it at that time and still do. Does any of you have any? I think uh, it uh, pretty much corresponds to what I said, except bridal. It looks a little further down on the occiput in this picture, I think, but it was pretty far post early because uh, you had to be able to see the cerebellum. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I agree, Paul. I think that this is a little bit lower, or it doesn't indicate that there was still a, you know, maybe a, a shelf of bone left below that. Yeah but not much of one, and that did allow me to look down into the, through the inside of the right, skull, just like, you know, just like this would be if you took a skull like you may have in the study here. And there was nothing in it. I mean, not down in that part. There was no tentorium. The x-rays of President Kennedy's skull, which we were privileged to see later, showed dramatically how large the fragmentation of the skull was compatible with what Bob saw originally. There was a bunch of bones sticking up there in the sort of the parietal area. And uh, along with what Dr. Baxter said, describing the effects of fracture of the cribriform plate of the skull, Abraham Lincoln, who was shot on one side with a fairly large caliber bullet, had black eyes on both sides and fractures of the cribriform plate on both sides, uh, both sides, and had hemorrhage around the orbit with a much less uh, velocity wound that President Kennedy suffered. My comment on the, on the eyes. The eyes were open, but uh, I didn't remember hemorrhage around the, uh, the eyes. I remember the eyes were open. It was straight there. I didn't remember all the black discoloration no. around the eyes. I didn't either. Um, this drawing, I could not look up over and around, so I couldn't speak exactly to this, but it seems to me it's this drawing that, that Bob, you must have been looking down tangentially at it because with the, just below the ear and your flat, that's going to be on a table. Well, that's what I'm saying. This is a little bit farther back. Yeah. I was looking straight into the right now, you know, not tangentially, but right into it. <clears throat> I, I would also comment about one other thing. When we went to the National Archives 10 years ago to look at 
Um, they were videotaping that with the robot. And we each one went in and looked separately at the photographs. And um, I can't remember the exact sequence, but when we came back out of the room where we were there, each one of us made a comment about what we were seeing. And that seemed to agree with, with things. And uh, I said, and I volunteered uh, that, well, one of the wounds uh, uh, had caused some comments and different things I had read and heard on television time and that um, they had noted in one of the pictures that there was hair covering all of this area where you see this large hole. When well, you say, I'm sorry, if I can interrupt for a second, when you say the large hole, you're referring to this, something like the picture here, on Exhibit yeah. 264. Yes, that they, there was no hole in that picture that looked like that. And I said, well, I, I think I know why that is. Um, I think it may be because if you'll notice, there are some fingers at the top of the photograph, apparently pulling a flap of scalp forward. And I think the flap was being pulled over that opening when they took the pictures. Several years later, I was told by one of the people who took some of the photographs that that was not the case. That that hand in the picture was not pulling any flap of scalp up over the skull. Do you remember who it was who told you that? It was one of the men who was taking the photograph. I met him uh, here at Dallas when the fellow who's written these kind of, I think, <clears throat> crazy books, uh, David Living. High Treason and the High Treason Two. He had a Harry Livingston. Harry Livingston. Yeah. yeah. He had a um, David Livingston. Uh, anyway, he had um, uh, a group of us here and videotaped us at one of the hotels here. We spent all Saturday morning down there. So I met uh, this photographer at, at that time. I can't remember his name. Would that be Stringer or Reedy? It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And he said that that was not false big stuff. I had always assumed that it was because I knew what the, that the hole was. Yeah. Uh, so they wonder, well, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I, <laughs> not unless I'm taking leave of my senses entirely. Uh, there was a hole there, and so my explanation of what was happening is he was just hand up in the wound, and they had sort of pulled it up for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, that was sort of an interesting sequence of events separated by several years. Dr. Peters, you've been nodding your head. Well, I, I would certainly agree with what Bob said. That it was my thought exactly that they just kind of pulled that flat back into place and took a picture so they could show how it looked with things restored as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the flat just kind of had been torn back, and now they were just kind of putting it back. And, snapping a picture for a reason I don't know, but uh, uh, I'm certain there was a hole there too. I walked right around and looked in his head. You, you could uh, look directly into the cranial vault and see a, and a, a considerable injury to the cerebral cortex and I thought at the time to the cerebellum. So I know the hole was big enough to look into. I estimated it at seven centimeters at that time and I don't know what the actual measurements were when they took the radiogram. But, I thought just exactly what Bob did. They, they were probably making a series of pictures, and they had just pulled that flat back up there to cover it up and took a picture of that to show the head with the flap restored, so to speak, for whatever reason. I'm sure there were many other pictures that were made at the same time. Uh, could we talk about the neck wound for <clears throat> a minute? Um, sure, that, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, Bob. 
to talk briefly about the neck wound, if we could. Uh, Dr. Perry, do you think that you were the one who probably had the best view of the neck wound? I'm the one that took my foot I said it uh, looked, looked like an entrance wound, and the foot appeared to be coming at him, and I based it mainly on the fact that it was a small wound in the neck. And that was I practiced the comments at the press conference both before and after by saying that neither Dr. Clark nor I knew how many bullets there were where they came from. Unfortunately, my comments uh, said it was an entrance wound. For my purposes today, the question is not with any of these whether you conclude that they were an entrance wound or an exit wound. Those are all small like that. So I, I estimated it, as I recall, about five millimeters, um, like a pencil eraser, I think I used it. And it was something like that. And uh, again, uh, pointing out that it was covered with some blood, I looked at it and see that five millimeters. Does any of you have a recollection that differs from that? Basically small, not jagged edges, five centimeters, millimeters, and something like that? That was no, the, the converse of that comment. I think you could sum sum up all of our comments on that wound and it was it appeared to be an insignificant wound. And except for where it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I mean there's a lot of material in the yeah. Dr. Perry and I when I back up the stairs into the OR after this had happened, I think both of us we were both talking in terms that this was an entrance or my impression when I saw it. Anyone who's hunted big game knows that, of course. 
In the first that day, more than you want to know that. That's what means. Okay. Uh, in the first uh, two or three days after the assassination, did you meet together at all and talk about it and try and put the pieces together of what you had observed and, and what you were hearing from the press? <coughs> I don't think it was true. I would never ever want to sit down and putting all this together. I don't remember it all sitting down like the day was the one that I knew it would come together today. discussing individually something this dramatic you're going to intermittently exchange comments with one another but uh, I don't think we tried to put that in place yet. We talked about it a lot in Cornwall like ourselves at that time. All of our officers were very close to With, with the exception of Dr. Perry, and I'll come back to him in just a moment, did any of you talk with any of the autopsy doctors in Bethesda in the first week or so after the assassination? No, I didn't. They're all shaking sure, your hosts again for separate. Yeah, I remember him getting the call and listening to him talk to the Yeah, I don't uh, Dr. Perry, there was obviously a controversy at the time of your uh, deposition by Doc, or by Mr. Spector uh, regarding whether you had received a call in the evening of the 22nd or the following morning. I know that memory does not improve with age, but I'm just wondering if you have had any subsequent thoughts that help you place that telephone call better. Uh, Dr. McClellan, you said there, there was no doubt about it, about the timing of that, and that's because you were in the office I yourself. As far as I am from here. So, 10 feet or so. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
And you had mentioned at that point that you had received a call. So it must have been before the your conference yeah, at the end of the afternoon, because I don't know it sounds about before that. that. So earlier in the morning, I was going to <clears throat> You know, as you might expect, Mr. John, those of us who are involved in hiring the divisions, uh, some people kind of all recognize the importance of exact time and date. But in the legal profession, we do, but we don't think that way. I can tell you part of the significance of this, and this has emerged in the in the deposition itself, in the deposition of Dr. Hume. He acknowledged that he wrote a draft of the autopsy report, which he then burned. He also burned his notes from the autopsy, which was not exactly what he had told to the Warren Commission. And one could uh, put together that the original draft does not have any reference to the bullets. Uh, wound in the neck and the subsequent draft does have that in it, but uh, that can be a reason that the time was important. For those of us who do medical writing, the writing system, uh, we would be lucky with anybody to be our first guest. Uh, it's often in the context, and we come back for the race and we think back later, but you know, you often sort of think of the way it's like kind of a great topic to do it. I mean, you have to teach them, uh, you recognize they have a value. Now, what, one of the very obvious issues that, that surrounds the, uh, the story of what you observed in your initial impressions was that there were suggestions both in the press conference and, and, and the observations that President Kennedy had been shot from the front. Uh, it subsequently turned out that uh, many people came to believe that President Kennedy was shot from behind and I'm sure you all have your opinions on that, and in the sense that's not the purpose of what we're doing here. But there became a concern about what your observations were versus what certainly the government ended up concluding later. The question I have for all of you is, did anyone from the government ever put any pressure on you or try to convince you against your will to either change your story or make a different sort of observation or to turn your observations at all? I'll come in first. Dr. Johnson. Uh, if you read my testimony that was taken in Dallas by our inspector, one counsel of the uh, you will see that, that uh, I alluded to an incident wound several times that he questioned me about my expertise uh, in uh, <coughs> missiles. Um, and I may as well go ahead and say, bring two or three things together as one. Um, when my, during my testimony, uh, I think you can see down here, you said, uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Mr. Spector said, would it be consistent then with an exit wound but of low velocity, as you put it? And I said, yes, with very low velocity at the point that you might think that this bullet barely made it through the soft tissues and just enough to drop out of the skin from the opposite side. In other words, uh, if this thing was coming out instead of in, uh, there sure wasn't much blast effect as Dr. Baxter alluded to. And uh, so I mentioned that it just maybe had dropped out. Well, you probably know about two weeks ago in the Dallas Morning News, there was an article confirming the assassination records review committee and that they had found a, missile, a bullet in the seat of the limousine which uh, that sparked some interest on my part reading that because, number one, I had not known until two weeks ago that there was a bullet in the seat of the window. So that was one thing. When I completed my testimony, our inspector followed me out in the hall. And he said, I'm going to tell you something that I don't want you to say anything about. He said, we have people who will testify that they saw a the shot from the front. That you can always get people to testify about something. But he said, we are pretty convinced that he was shot from the back. And uh, that implied that although some of us thought that might initially have been an insurance wound, that uh, you know, that's the end of the discussion. And, and uh, we, we did have people to identify that. I don't know whether you can screw that as, as uh, pressure or not, but certainly I was surprised that he said, don't say this about anything about that anymore. A young resident, 31 years old, 
you're not going to believe it, about, about that episode to anybody. Because at that time, I think we were all, uh, the whole country was, I mean, you didn't joke about anything. There were jokes going around about what happened to that family. We were very serious about that. I thought that was a little unusual. Did anyone else have an experience of that sort with Mr. Spector or with... Well, I'd like to ask a question about that. Now, as uh, we've reconstructed it many times over the years, uh, the first bullet was fired as supposed to have missed. The second bullet went through the President and Governor Conley, and the third bullet hit President Kennedy in the skull. That's the way uh, I think uh, it's been explained to us over the years. Now, like Ron, I've never heard about this other bullet. There's been a lot written about the so-called pristine bullet, and the, uh, Dr. Latimer and uh, the FBI fired bullets into 15 feet of pine board, showing there was almost no deformity. And if you laid the pristine bullet on a flat surface such as this, it would roll irregularly, showing it was really a little deformed. And I've understood that the amount of lead missing from it actually equal to calculate the weight of lead from measured from President Kennedy's x-rays, Governor Connolly's arm, and the bullet fragments taken from his thigh, suggesting that it was indeed the same bullet that hit President Kennedy and Governor Connolly. But... Who? The forensic... Oh, yeah. I've gotten just heard of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, if there really was another bullet, was it of the same caliber? I, I'd like to know what's known about that. I couldn't contribute anything, but just an interest. It makes it, as Ron said, a little more complex thing to have another bullet available in addition to the bullet that was found on the car. Is that correct? This, this is a bullet fragment, so that's oh, not, not right. a bullet. It's, it's a okay. small fragment. It's a fragment. At the time of the warrant, you know, the writing somewhere, uh, they took that limousine apart. Put it back together. Uh, I was told that in Washington and at the time was in my testimony. And uh, it's interesting, several of the members of the committee did not know that they had done that. And there was gilding metal found on the inside of the windshield in that thing. Because there was a hole in the windshield. They took that whole thing apart, as you know, and they put it back together. So it was carefully just that. Uh, apropos what you asked Dr. Jones, uh, I had. Exactly the opposite experience. I was advised by almost everybody I talked to, Secret Service, FBI, and the ones in the county, to tell the truth. Best I knew it, in its entirety, and the whole rest of the Every occasion, and that occurred on a number of occasions, that they just had me be sure that everything, as best I knew it, I was. So uh, I can say that this for me, uh, they couldn't make every effort. I was never pressured. I think all of us are told to be in order. I don't think it's Well, I have no idea that I have a thing that Pepper mentions in Just for the record, you're pointing yeah, in with your left, finger at the left temple and out the back of the head. And there was a lot of blood on the left temple. There was blood everywhere, but there was a lot of blood on, on the left temple. So I didn't question that. Um, and in fact, in, in something else, uh, Pepper uh, testified somewhere else. He denied that he said that to me in the, <laughs> in the Warren Commission. Um, and I told him, I said, Pepper, don't you remember? No, I never said that to And I never said the cerebellum fell out. Yes, you did, too. Uh, but I didn't argue with him. Uh, but the upshot of it is what that led to was uh, Mr. Garrison uh, 
case in New Orleans. Uh, and he uh, put together a scenario where he thought someone, because of what I had said about the left infant bullet, was in the storm sewer on the left side of the car and fired this bullet that killed the president, you know, another gunman. He didn't say that Oswald was not there, he just said there was another gunman. And so he never contacted, Garrison never contacted me until it was essentially time to have the uh, case in court. Clay Shaw. Right. And so I, I got a call one morning, um, and it was from his office, one of the people in uh, Garrison's office. And he wanted to know if I would come to New Orleans and testify. And I said, well, you know, uh, it's odd that none of you had talked to him before this. I've been hearing something about it on television and something like that. Um, and they said, well, we assume that you still uh, believe that the force of the bullet was, as you said in your written testimony, uh, right after it, I'm picking up it. And his voice went up about three octaves, and he said, well, what? And I said, no. And I explained to him that I had learned other things about the circumstances at the time. And that Dr. Jenkins had told me, I didn't see anything here, I was just stating what I had been told, and that I wrote that down in my written uh, statement right after the assassination. And so uh, that was kind of took the wind out of the sail of that particular prosecution. I have two comments relating to this, what the Justin said, my comment. In the afternoon of the assassination, we were up in the OR in Lico Porto. I think it's LIPO in Porto, P O R T O. In the OR, and he said he was uh, he referred to the president because he had been down there and he said, I put my finger, he was shot in the left, he said, I, he was shot in the left, he said, I put my finger in the hole. And I, uh, I think that was part of it. Uh, okay. I never heard that. That's and so, in fact, I told Mr. Heron the other day, I gave him the report those name and his telephone number, and I said, you know, if you're going to have the group down here, why don't you get the report go down here to clarify that comment, uh, if indeed that was the case or, or not the case. But I think that was part of, of where some of that came from. The other comment that, to clarify what I said, regarding Arlen Spector, I'm saying that he pressured me because that was after the testimony that I had given. I think what he was implying was that that uh, that you you could get people to testify to the president to shot him from the front. He's asking you to be in the speech. I think that's right. Not to talk about it. He didn't say don't. He didn't know you were going to Don't say that. what you think. Uh, but uh, he suggested that I'm not talk about what he was telling okay. you. didn't know you weren't going to talk about it anyway. Not for yeah. <laughs> I think that each of you now has responded to the question about whether you could felt any pressure to ever Dr. McClellan unless I, I missed that. Uh, I felt no pressure. Did any time anything ever happen subsequently to the Warren Commission where you felt any pressure from anyone in the government to testify one way or another way about this? No. No. Dr. Peters, uh, no, so he has never had any pressure. The only, uh, well, fine. Well, when did well, you tell me that story? It was that afternoon. Was that afternoon? It was, my, it was that afternoon, and I believe we were upstairs, but he had mentioned that he had put his finger in it. And he was sort of known for, as the guy that oh, went yeah. down and put his fingers in, in missile uh, or bullet range uh, wounds. And uh, that was his comment. Where is he from? Oh, I don't know if he's actually from. He was still from the department. Yeah, still from the department. Is the name Jane Carolyn Wester familiar oh, yes. to any of you? Yeah, that's yes, Jane Wester. Uh, do you know what her position was in 1963, November 63? Was the assistant uh, supervisor of the operating room. Yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, I'd like to hand you a copy of the supervisor. Mm -hmm.
her testimony to the Warren Commission. Let me just ask you one question about that. You're all welcome to read this if you wish, or not read this if you wish. I'm going to be making a reference to this and ask a question. Uh, this is in uh, Volume 6 of the Warren hearing. Uh, she says, and this is on page uh, 121, I received a phone call from the emergency room asking us to set up for a craniotomy. And Mr. Spector says, and what is a craniotomy in lay language? Ms. Wester, that's an exploration of the head. Mr. Spector, was there any other request made at that time? Ms. Wester, yes, well, immediately following. Following that, I received a call to, to set up for a thorac thoracotomy. Thoracotomy, excuse me, which is an exploration of the chest. Mr. Spector, and were those two setups made in accordance with the request you received? Ms. Wester, yes, I immediately signed personnel to set up these two rooms for these two cases. Mr. Spector, and what room was used for the craniotomy? Ms. Wester, the craniotomy was set up in room seven. Question for you, does any of you recall whether uh, you made a call to Ms. Wester to set up a craniotomy in conjunction with uh, President Kennedy? Let me try the question again. Does any of you recall calling Ms. Wester in regard to setting up a craniotomy for President Kennedy? No. 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 Does, does any of you have any light to shed on this observation that she made? I, I think the only light you could shed on it is that somebody maybe Doris Nelson, the, the head nurse in the emergency room. She was in the room with us all of the time that I recall. Uh, but she might have initiated a call. Someone, anybody on the emergency room staff with a head injury that would call up and say, be prepared. Uh, so I think it's totally insignificant, uh, the fact that she testified to that. And it just has no meaning, except be prepared. We set up a lot of rooms we don't necessarily do. <coughs> All the time. Yeah. What is this? I noticed uh, Ms. Wester said, what, or Mr. Spector said, what else, if anything, was on that stretcher? And Ms. Wester, there were several glassine packets, small packets of hypodermic units well packed in and sterilized and there were several others some alcohol sponges and way of learning to take those things i definitely know on cards and sheets of course does that mean anything to you no i mean um Oh, that's the little, uh, little plastic things they used to put those ampules in. Those what? The former stamp collector, I remember them for places where you put the stamps. Uh, have you all seen the autopsy protocol that was drafted? by Dr. Humes, Boswell, and Fink. Uh, I don't recall that. Uh, Dr. Perry, what do you remember how soon it was that you saw the report after the assassination? Dr. Yeah, this, uh, this room, yeah. 
Dr. McClone? Yeah, yeah. Later. Yeah. I saw it at the National Archives, and I, I've always wondered if it really was accurate because when it came to adrenals, which I was uh, very interested in because of living in the the Hume had written uh, two or three words which were not legible at all. If that was his, act, his actual writing down as he went through the autopsy, I thought it was uh, inaccurate uh, for uh, anyone else who had to transcribe it subsequently. And I asked about that at the time, and they said, well, they didn't want to make too much reference to the adrenals because Robert Kennedy did not want them to say anything about the <coughs> adrenals because he was going to run for president and he didn't want people to think he had a congenitally acquired Addisonian disease. Of course, his brother had had it. Probably President Kennedy had developed it from tuberculosis, I think. Uh, a common cause of uh, bilateral destruction of the adrenals in those days. But um, you, uh, the autopsy report they showed me was terribly done. I, I don't know what you saw, but it was, the writing was illegible. And just scribbling as they came to each organ. When he came to adrenals, it just a little scribble. It was not legible. So I don't, that, they showed that to me as the autopsy report by Dr. Hume. And I said, well, we had a great guy in Dallas who should have done this autopsy, Earl Rose. He was a forensic pathologist trained, but didn't have a chance. Dr. Baxter, did you see the autopsy report? I've never seen it. Heard a lot about it, but never saw it. I think we may have seen some excerpts from it, or maybe even seen a reprint of it. Uh, I remember seeing it in the book. Would any of you have thought that it would have been appropriate for you to talk in, in greater depth with uh, doctors Hume, Fink, or Boswell about the autopsies, have a discussion either immediately after the assassination or at some point? Well, I understood they had called Dr. Perry and Dr. Carico, and I think they could tell them as much as any. That was right at the time, I mean. One thing, as a, as a layperson, when I look at the autopsy protocol and at what we have called the face sheet, which I think is what uh, Dr. Peters uh, was referring to with the drawings, I'm not able to identify really where the wounds are and what, what the scope of the wounds are. And the photographs also are somewhat difficult to uh, interpret, certainly for me and from what I have seen in talking with other doctors about this, it is often difficult for them to interpret as well as what was happening so that the, the physical record uh, leaves something to be desired, uh, I think would be a, a probably a fair statement. Mr. Gunn, am I in here and recalling that there were six measurements made on that particular one? I recall the measurements made were using the dinosaur process, 14 centimeters down and 10 centimeters to one side. Uh, Dr. Hume made some precise measurements and recorded. There was some discussion about that. It, his pictograph did not correspond, correspond with his measurements. I don't know how his pick people were when he was growing up. Finally, he's got too long an arm and too big a head. And I would throw those things away. But I think there were some precise measurements <coughs> made in relation to bony prominence in the top of those wounds. And that was recorded, was it not? Let, let me give you copies of the face sheet, which is exhibit MD1, and the autopsy protocol, which is MD. But is that not in there, those measurements? We can talk about that in just a moment. Because yeah. I recall seeing those measurements uh, early on. 14 or 10 centimeters or something like that. Yeah, that 14 from the chromium and 14 of the man, I remember seeing that originally. Uh, 
Exhibit 1, these are the only notes that are still in existence from those that were taken during the autopsy itself. So these are the ones I saw so many years ago that I remember those numbers. But that's Exhibit 1 that you're referring to. And then the second one, the autopsy protocol, is Exhibit 3. So this is the report that Drs. Hume, Sink, and Boswell subsequently signed. There is, in addition to this, a supplementary brain examination, which I also have a copy of if, you, if you're interested in that. I can give that one to you as well. <clears throat> if you look at page 2 of Exhibit 1, there's a drawing that, in his deposition, Dr. Uh, Boswell referred to, said that he was the one who had drawn that and who had written uh, the markings on that. And again, as a layperson, when I look at this and I see a portion of it this mark can by 17 with missing underneath it, I wondered what that meant. So I talked with Dr. Boswell to some extent about this during the deposition, and I asked him to mark on a um, anatomically correct skull, plastic skull, uh, what the scope of the, of the damages were. And I brought that with me today, and I'd like to show that to you and see if that helps uh, with you to explain uh, anything that you observed or if, you, if it appears to be to be uh, consistent. Can you orient me? Are we looking uh, which direction? I'm assuming that when I look at this, that this is right and this is left. That's correct. So uh, nose is uh, at the top. So I, I will uh, take a look at that for a moment, and I'll uh, talk to you about this. Uh, the skull that I have here is exhibit number 74, with the markings on this having been uh, made by Dr. Boswell at his deposition and signed by him on February 26, 96, down here. Uh, he identified, although I won't ask you about this particular question, the entrance wound as being approximately the location down here. Uh, and he stressed throughout that this is approximate and this cannot be considered to be accurate, but it was his best recollection, so there's nothing precise about this at all. So the line that he marked is Exhibit 1, which goes of this sort, this direction here, which you can see. He said that the skull in that area was missing, and I'll read you the, the provision of the transcript from that. And he said where line 2 is, this was a laceration in the scalp. And if you notice, here, again, looking at the, the plastic models, that there is a place where line two intersects line one, and it would seem to go down to the, uh, to the right of the right orbit. Uh, Dr. Boswell was not certain whether that was torn during the course of the autopsy or not, uh, but he thought that it probably was. And again, I have his exact words here from the, from the deposition, if I can uh, read these. Now, this suggests that a, a very large portion of the skull is missing uh, at the time that the autopsy began. Does that correspond with your own observations, or do you feel that you're not even in a position to be able to make an observation What's on the, it? What's uh, the overlying issue? Or are we saying that the whole skin and everything is on it, or is it just skin? Can over this or not over it in the autopsy? For, for practical purposes, first, the autopsy report is not clear. The autopsy report itself is not clear on this issue, so this comes from the If you look at page 2 of Exhibit 1, there's a drawing that in his deposition Dr. Uh, Boswell referred to, said that he was the one who had drawn that and who had written uh, the markings on that. And again, as a layperson, when I look at this and I see a portion of it, this mark, 10 by 17 with missing underneath it, I wondered what that meant. So I talked with Dr. Boswell to some extent about this during the deposition. And I asked him to mark on a um, anatomically correct skull, plastic skull, uh, what the scope of the of the damages were. And I brought that with me today, and I'd like to show that to you and see if that helps uh, with you to explain uh, anything that you observed or if, you, if it appears to be to be uh, consistent. Okay. 
orient me, uh, we're looking uh, this direction. I'm assuming that when I look at this, that this is right and this is left. That's correct. So uh, nose is uh, at the top. I will uh, take a look at that for a moment, and I'll uh, talk to you about this. Uh, the skull that I have here is exhibit number 74, with the markings on this having been uh, made by Dr. Boswell at his deposition and signed by him on February 26, 96, down here. Uh, he identified, although I won't ask you about this particular question, the entrance wound as being approximately the location down here. Uh, and he stressed throughout that this is approximate and this cannot be considered to be accurate, but it was his best recollection, so there's nothing precise about this at all. So the line that he marked is Exhibit 1, which goes of this sort, this direction here, which you can see. He said that the skull in that area was missing, and I'll read you the, the provision of the transcript from that. And he said where line 2 is, this was a laceration in the scalp. And if you notice, here, again, looking at the, the plastic model, that there is a place where line two intersects line one, and it would seem to go down to the, uh, to the right of the right orbit. Uh, Dr. Boswell was not certain whether that was torn during the course of the autopsy or not, uh, but he thought that it probably was. And again, I have his exact words here from the, from the deposition, if I can uh, read these. Now, this suggests that a, a very large portion of the skull is missing uh, at the time that the autopsy began. Does that correspond with your own observations, or do you feel that you're not even in a position to be able to make an observation What's on the uh, overlying tissue? Or are we saying that the whole skin and everything is on it, or is it just skin, skin over this or not over it in the autopsy? For practical purposes. First, the autopsy report is not clear. The autopsy report itself is not clear on this issue, so this comes from the deposition. For the most part, the scalp was there for the most part, the bone was uh, missing at the time the autopsy began, although some pieces came during the course of the autopsy and they were able to fit them in. So he's not saying that all of this was uh, missing throughout the autopsy, but that this was missing at the time the autopsy uh, began. Now, uh, you're obviously treating the, the, the patient in a very different perspective from a from person performing the autopsy, and I understand that. And to some extent, you may not have something useful to make observe about that, or you may have something. I'm just interested in, in whether this would seem to correspond with what you were in a, in a position to be able to observe or, or not. Well, let me go around the room again. The, if this is a skin laceration or a skin disruption, that's not pointing to the, uh, the skull down along the right eye. Line two on the on exhibit seventy four. Yeah. And it, to my recollection, that skin was intact. There was no facial injury on the right side that extended all the way down to the eye. And I feel like I did have enough view from my sense to see that. Secondly, I thought the skin over the top of the head was intact from what I saw. But I what was under the skin and whether the skull was there or not. As I mentioned earlier this morning, my initial impression in looking at the president was that he did not look like I had thought he would. In my earlier testimony before the warrant commission, was that he had facial relaxation of tissue. It seemed to be a relaxation of tissue, and I suppose that that could possibly be accounted for by loss of skull. Well, the, as I understand that oblique line going across the top of the skull. Line two. Right. That's consistent with the parietal bone sticking out through the laceration just in that position. 
and but I'm not quite sure I understand from the drawing uh, how much of the skull is missing in relation to those lines. Now, what Dr. Uh, Boswell suggested is, and these lines are all approximate, and he mm -hmm. wanted that to be stressed, that the skull itself was missing here. The scalp was not missing, but the scalp could it was torn and lacerated in different places. So I mean, it's conceivable that it could have been pulled up in one part or pulled up in another part at any time after the assassination. Yeah. Uh, but the skull itself was missing underneath. Well, that's consistent, you know, uh, the only thing that I might think is that it was more posterior, more down on the occipital bone than I'm understanding from the skull here. Uh, have a little bulge in it back there, yeah. towards the end. Right in there, yeah, almost yeah, yeah. down. Right. Down in there. Yeah. There, well, a little wider opening there. Uh, the part I'm pointing now to what I'm understanding to be the occipital yeah, bone on right, yeah. on the skull, and that is part of what he has is missing in his right. in I've his that drawing. Was thrown out onto the street. Yeah, yeah a large right fragment of the parietal yeah. bone was it? So the occipital parietal, not parietal, occipital. Well, okay, occipital parietal. Right. That area. piece of uh, right. bone back. I imagine where the suture is. Uh, so. If he agrees that it goes back to that far posterior and lost the bone, then that's what I saw. And, and as I recall from having seen on a number of occasions the Zapruder film, it's clear uh, when the bullet strikes the president's head that there's a bright flash as a flap of skin is blown down kind of over the right ear. And that would be consistent with. Uh, being an injury going down toward the eye, and then it probably was pulled back up in some way. It didn't continue to lie over the ear, but it, it, it did at the moment of impact. It flew back, and it was very clear that there was a flap being turned at that moment. When I first walked in the room and saw the president of the flight from the Elmberg position, I agreed completely with what Dr. Jones said. Uh, his face, it appeared. Uh, his forehead, uh, the hair was down just a little bit like he might be frowning, but he wasn't. And uh, the, um, I agree with uh, what Bob said about the thing being mostly posterior occipital, mostly in some parietal bone missing, so you could look right in and see the brain. When they showed me the autopsy report uh, uh, 25 years later, there was a cut on President Kennedy's scalp coming down towards his eye which I would swear was not there that day. I thought they pro probably made that what well, looked like maybe an inch or inch and a half extension maybe to, to do part of the autopsy. It looked like it were cut with a knife. It didn't look like a tear, but I suppose it could have been. So, you know, I, I did ask that question in, in the deposition, and I was told repeatedly by several different witnesses that the photographs were taken before any um, um, cuts or decisions were made uh, to the head, so that was in a sense pristine. Well, you can see it coming down there, but it, you know, as you looked at his face, you didn't get the idea that there was a cut extending down to his forehead or anything. Wouldn't you agree with that, Ron? Yes, I would agree. There was no facial injury whatsoever. <coughs> now, I'm approaching this as a lay person, which may be good or may be bad. I would have imagined myself if I had seen President Kennedy in, in trauma room one, and this part of the skull, again, the part that's within uh, line one of uh, Dr. Boswell, if this were missing, I would imagine it would be noticeable to me as a layperson that there is severe damage to, to the skull. Is, would that be a misperception on my part? And from which angle you approach it? From the front, you might not. Right. Okay. okay. So, uh, None of you made observations that would, or maybe the question is, did any of you see any uh, appearance of damage by looking just at the scalp and just at the hair that would suggest that that much of the skull was missing, or were you even in a position to be able to? Well, I think you could see the top part of the head reasonably well. He had a very thick, bushy head of hair, and uh, difficult to see him through the hair. Oh, I didn't see any indentation of the skull or anything like that, like half of the top of the head. I grew oh. matted with blood. Unless you were up there 
Right. And directly examining him, I don't think anybody could make a statement. From what I saw, I mean, it was just one mass of blood in here. I was amazed when I saw the first x-ray of the skull, the lateral skull, at the extent of the fragmentation of the skull. I did not appreciate that, I think because a lot of it was discovered by scalp at the time when we were doing We were doing a resuscitation, not a forensic autopsy. Now, uh, for many people, the, the ultimate question is whether President Kennedy was shot from, from the front or from behind, and I want to avoid that sort of question, not because it's unimportant, but what, I, what I'm mostly interested in are the observations that you have about what you observed yourself rather than what you might, might imagine. Uh, but in saying that, I also don't want to cut off observations that you think, based upon your own experience and your examination with President Kennedy, that would be useful to have as part of the record. So I'm not encouraging you to give your ultimate conclusions or your beliefs, but to the extent that you, you think that you have something appropriate to put into the record based upon your own experience in the trauma room, one in your experience as medical experts, I would be interested in, in hearing that. Dr. Jones? Your, your question has to do with what we saw as we walked in. Not the, what we've learned 30 years later. Yeah. And Dr. Perry and I walked in and <coughs> looked at the president. Dr. Jericho was at the head of the table. And uh, we both recognized it probably simultaneously that it did not look like he had an airway or any IV access. The entrance wound with the dressing of the neck wound that we initially looked at, I thought it was, was very small. It was frankly looked supportive of something like that. Something. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank You've, you've all made the uh, descriptions previously about what you observed. Is there anything else that you think should be part of the record based upon your observations that I have not asked you about? Let me ask a question in regard to that. Uh, I'm a, I think my subsequent thoughts about the nature of the one and the direction from which the bullet may have come were colored almost uh, where you couldn't separate the two influences by what I saw of the headline in the trauma room and then by what I think I saw, well, no, I saw, but whether I interpreted it properly is another thing on the, the fruit of the film, putting those two things together. And I couldn't help but put them together. And it looks to me uh, fairly as if he were shot from the front. And that was not inconsistent with what I saw as a, perhaps an exit wound from a bullet entering in the front uh, in the back of his head. And uh, I remember I, I saw that uh, one night. It was, I guess, First time they showed it, that was a lot of very um, And when I first saw that film, and his head was thrown backwards, it first looked like maybe that that was because the car sped up and therefore jerked his head backwards. But they replayed the film in slow motion, and then several times after that, I, I've seen the same thing. And the car. Uh, didn't start moving forward rapidly until several frames after his head had been thrown backwards. By what strikes me, it could have been the force from a bullet coming from the front. That's just my impression. That's all. And that's not inconsistent with my view of that wound. <coughs> I think uh, at the time, that day, I think Justice Dr. Perry described it as 
it could have been an infantry room with a big exit wound in the back of the skull. We were learn later he had a bullet that was transversed through the back of his neck and out the front. <coughs> and that Malcolm would be best qualified to speak about that. Uh, because he saw, and I guess Charlie and me were wrong too, the wound before anything was done to it. But uh, Dr. Latimer, my friend, and the FBI fired 500 shots into skulls uh, with various contents, liquid, plaster, parents, and so forth, and showed that when an individual is struck from behind with a high velocity missile, the head is propelled towards the shooter. And of course, I didn't know that that day. I hadn't seen the Zapruder film yet, and uh, all we had was the president lying before us. But uh, their evidence would tend to suggest that the president's head was propelled backward because of the nature of the and velocity of the bullet that struck the skull, going from a harder outer cranium into a softer custard-like brain. And uh, that was that's the only evidence I know for the head going backward. Sure, can, I I make a, can I make a comment about that? Sure. I, I'm no physicist, and I'm no ballistic expert, but it just seems to me, and I appreciate that those are not good parallel experiences because those dogs were either suspended on strings or were stuck on stools, not attached to anything. The president's body was attached to a 170 some odd pound body, and the force of that bullet uh, was transmitted uh, to his head as it was attached to that body. So I don't think you can say that because an unattached skull blows off like that, that that relates to anything. Well, I think the forces could be applied to the skull. Well, Walter Alvarez, the physicist, did predict the actual behavior of the missile, you know, prior to them carrying out the experiment. Well, but what I'm saying, Paul, is that you can't say that an unattached skull, as opposed to a skull that's attached to a heavy body, that it could propel the skull off the stool, which weighs nothing, but it couldn't propel that and with that heavy body attached to it in that direction, unless the bullet were uh, fired from the front and it carried the head and the body backwards, which I think is very likely why. But an unattached skull sitting on the stool, I mean, you can say well, maybe that. Well, maybe forces directing just the head could be applied to the head, regardless of what it's attached to. I mean, it's going it to couldn't undergo carry a the body. certain motion. Couldn't carry the body back. No, probably not. At that point, well, the body would come into play, I think. May I also wonder, perhaps a physiological explanation with some consideration. When you fit the frog in brainstem injury, they go into marked focus sockets. When you give electric shock to a frog, <coughs> they go into marked focus sockets. And occasionally, even use the fracture vertebrae and they use muscle relaxants. And massive brainstem stimulation <coughs> in both animals and humans causes extension of the very strong extensor muscles of the back rather than the flexor muscles of the body. And they are stronger, they hold us in the upright position. And almost all of those injuries propel the body, both animal and human, into an open stopness position, which is hyperextension. And it may be that the massive electrical stimulation of a brain stem injury would produce, just like electric shock does, or like pitching does, open stopness, which would stem the back and the head. I don't know if it's true or not, but I offer it for consideration as a possible physiologic explanation of what my state on this. Now, in addition to that, uh, only a second or so before, he'd been shot through the neck, and he had his arm, uh, which people say is a reflex described in the late 1800s by a Russian neurologist, uh, which is evidence of acute spinal cord injury with opposite and with the arm being propelled. And if you look closely at the pictures, his hands were not coming up as one would grasp his neck. They're coming up together above the wound, which is, the, I don't remember the name of the individual who described it, but a sign of acute spinal cord injury. So he could have already had a little bit of that to see at the time the second bullet hit. I don't think that there was any evidence, and I should stay out of this conversation a little bit, but I don't think there was any evidence of spinal cord injury in the president. So, I mean, I don't know if there is a bullet showing fragmentation of the, uh, an injury to one of the cervical vertebrae on a lateral view. 
So there could have been some confusion in that area, which could have been a, quite a stimulation to the spinal cord, resulting in that reflex. But that, I don't think it was bruised itself. I think that that is something that some people see on the X-rays, some don't. But there was, but there was no uh, evidence in the autopsy itself of any spinal cord injury, as far as I understand. But the record speaks for itself. We're getting off a little bit into here. <laughs> To what ordinary citizens might speculate about instead of what we as doctors yeah, have thought that day. Yeah. Relating to the injury, well, we're off, we're off record. I think we'll be finished shortly. <laughs> One of the things that might have come out in uh, questioning was whether or not that could even be due to, say, bone fragment. I don't know whether that injury was traced all the way from the back to the front for sure and demonstrated conclusively that those two wounds uh, truly corrected, connected. I mean, it's not a matter of record that there was also feeling that along the nose at the time. On the knot at the tie? On the knot at the tie. There was some injury at the tie and there was some building metal, which is what is jacket metal on the knot at the tie. I don't know. I think that's in the record. It, w one of the things in the, during the autopsy, they did not link the wound in the back to the neck. That did not come until after they spoke with Dr. Perry. So there was no uh, tracing. There, there was an attempt to use the probe, and they found that the probe went in a short and then they could not find that it connected anywhere. You mentioned the vagaries of trajectory, but when you're putting the probe in someone who's flat, but it's someone who's moving, it's entirely different sort of pathways, entirely different than a person in action and one that's flat. So sure, no, the, the only point was they did not make that determination during the course of the autopsy. Oh, it's 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 they learned a long time ago that probe in one was a proof. Okay. Any other observations? Well, then let me thank you again for your time. I appreciate uh, your coming here today. And we depend on another 30 years before we ask you. <laughs> My promise. <laughs>